Who knows? First chapter is just authority. You guys are used to figuring out what is authority, what isn't. Judicial, legislative, regulatory authority. Let's just think about where you started and where you are today. I like to think, boy, I made a lot of progress, but uh, maybe in my own, only in my own head. Um, we have chapter two dealing with concepts of income. We have chapters three and four that deal with what's excludable from income. We computed gains and losses under chapter six. Then we moved on to chapter 20. And we looked at issues pertaining to one dealing with character of income and the consequences associated with character. We looked at capital assets, non-capital assets, 1245, 1250, 1231. Lots of issues. Got uh, those all down. Uh, we moved on. We looked at the concept of who is taxable, right, under Chapter 12. And several classes talking about uh, deductions, right? And with respect to deductions, we looked at three different baskets. We looked at Code Section 162, 262, 263, whether or not things could be deducted immediately, capitalized, personal, non-deductible expense. That frames the issue. We saw a lot of peanut butter and jelly sections, right? So, uh, where um, you had to consider the fact that uh, example 162 is with Code Section 274, there are limitations, right? On what's deductible. So even if it meant the ordinary necessary, Code Section 274 might limit it. Um, then we saw regulatorily that sometimes there's um, whole sections, for example, Entertainment expenses under Regulation 162-5 that spell out what's deductible and what's not. So it's not just in the code; um, it's in those regulatory sections. Um, we then spent at least a class talking about depreciation deductions, right? And we learned that with respect to depreciation deductions, you need essentially three ingredients. It's not the most compli complicated formula. You need three ingredients to make this happen. You need to have a method, which we know the most common method is. Again, Sherman? Double declining. Double declining, right? Double declining with real estate straight line. Uh, and there's some variation you're in. You know that you need to not only know the method, you need to know the class life to figure out the recovery period. And then we know that there's four conventions, right, that can that can play out here. So you have four different conventions, and with those four conventions, figure out first year appreciation, you can figure out the last year of depreciation. Okay? So those are things that you have to know as well. Um, and if you're very mechanical, uh, you will persevere. If you're not so mechanical, unfortunately, you will not do well. And as I pointed out to you, and I'm not keeping secrets, I want you guys to do well, and there's no secrets here, um, you will or should anticipate several questions, right? Um, dealing with depreciation deductions, right? So just don't say, you blindsided us. I can't believe you asked appreciation questions. And I'm on tape, right? Not only here, but Nellie's got me on tape too. James. Professor, while we're on the exam, is there anything else that you want us to look at? Depreciation deductions, but what we're going through today is going to be critical, is something deductible. In a particular year, is something includable in a different year. All those kind of things that lend themselves very readily to multiple choice questions. So, uh, I, was, I was referring to the short answer ones. Well, the short answer ones, you know, anticipate things, travel expenses, things like that, that I've tried to emphasize that you should have a good handle on because those kind of things come up all the time. Um, I have a question, Professor. Uh, I 
explain this switch from a double decline into straight line? Well, your computer will do it for you, but you, it's trial and error. Whichever one yields the greater deduction, you're permitted to use. So, in the example that we went through, there was, if you recall, I think after uh, year four, there was a year and a half that remained. So, in that particular question, you try it with the 40% double declining. And you try it because you guys are expert at straight line and taking into account there is a year and a half. So the fifth year, the, the numerator is going to be one. The denominator is over the length of, you know, with straight line is over the total time period, one over 1.5. Whatever yields the greatest deduction. So there's no magic to it. Um, again, your computer will give you the right answer, but you got to explain to the client why all of a sudden the computer is using a different method. Uh, for exam purposes, you would just um, try trial and error. There's no, there's no shortcut to it. There's no, if some of you see the study guides to income tax, they have tables that you can use to give you the percentage deduction. And in that percentage deduction is built in exactly what we're referring to. So. Uh, sometimes it's camouflaged, truth be told. Um, so then we moved on, and we, we moved on from chapter 14, and we moved on to chapter 15. Chapter 15 looks at investment expenses. Give it to um, what code section? Got to know code section 212 and the peanut butter and jelly. Uh, rather to two code, code section 212 is. Oh, you also got to think about 274, but what else? 165, 165 deals with loss. Say again? <coughs> well, 262 is not peanut butter jelly. Uh, 262 says, hey, if you're getting divorced, some of those expenses may not be investment expenses or conserving or preserving property, but instead, those expenses are personal. But what I was referring to is, again? 162. 162. Well, that's a different, that's a trade or business expense. In terms of 212, if you recall, <coughs> some code section 212 expenses have to be what? Capitalized, right? 263. You recall that? So, um, bear that in mind that sometimes these expenses, just like 162, some of those expenses have to be capitalized. Let's not forget that sometimes code section two, two, uh, 212 expenses have to be capitalized. We saw that in a case and it employed um, regulation 212-1K where if you spend money to acquire a property, you can't just deduct that money. Right? The, the expenditure, you have to capitalize it in the cost basis of the property, right? These are things that hopefully you're picking up on. So we went through code section 212, we went through chapter 15. So, Professor, one question. So they're not deductible, they they're not go deductible. To the cost basis? Yeah, they go into the cost basis. Right? And these are the kind of things, guys, on the regulation portion of your CPA exam, these are potentially how you're going to get caught. Hopefully you won't because you're going to say, gee, maybe the next is study for the final exam, but it, not only did I do better on the final exam, so it's class, but I also did well in the CPA regulation portion, right? So you know, this is the kind of investment in time, guys, you got to make because it's got a duality to it. <laughs> Well, in this class, plus the CPA exam. So um, I want you to be prepared. We went through problems beginning on page 464, um, looking at um, investment expenses, gains and losses. And we know this should refresh your memory from chapter six. Gains must be realized and recognized. Losses realized, recognized, and allowed. And we went through several different examples, all right? And then we turned our attention to chapter 19, timing issues, right? Uh, Four-letter word, 
four letter word is when. And we said with respect to this chapter, it could be divided into four quadrants, right? And just to remind ourselves, cash method, inclusion issues, then deduction issues, and the accrual method, inclusion and deduction issues, right? So you guys help me out here with respect to the cash method. Um, yes, when you get dollars, you have to include them. If there's something else, you say, what else you have? Inclusion, guys. Only when you receive dollars. In terms of a check, uh, never. And what, what do you call that? <coughs> receive a check. What? What in our parlance, tax parlance? What do you call that? Negotiable. It may or may not be. It may be negotiable, it may not. It may be assignable, it may not be. But what is the issue? You gotta frame it. In this quadrant, don't you guys have something written in the top left quadrant? You have CE cash equivalent, right? The cash equivalent, right? Contrast, we saw a case where if it's just a mere evidence of indebtedness, right, it doesn't cut it, right? Mere evidence of indebtedness, not considered inclusion. What other element causes inclusion? Do you remember? Justin, do you remember? Uh, what? Uh, Cash received. Oh, I'm a little nervous. Oh, and you don't want to say that on Thursday, though, right? That guy's constructive receipt. Received. What is the principle of constructive receipt? Your client says, hey, what's constructive receipt? Want to describe it? The person must, uh, the receiver must physically get a check and be able to cash it. That's the concept of constructive receipt? I'm the client, I think. Provide. What is constructive receipt? And are you saying to me as a client that I have to get something physically? Or, uh, I went recognizing it by. You will, but what if, just a, give me an event where that might happen. For example, if you mail me a check to my office and I pick a check up from the mailbox and I'm able to deposit or. That's the actual receipt. That's not constructive. You physically have it. It's actual. Okay. So we're constructive. You have an agreement. Okay, James is gonna pick up my check for me. We already signed an agreement. So once James get it, then. So, uh, when the payer mails check, I don't know if I agree with you on that. Because if I mail you a check on December 31st and you're cashed by the taxpayer, you may not know that I put the check in the mail, right? One of the biggest lies around, checks in the mail. Should you have to take it into income? Year one, because I said I mailed it then? I mean, I'm talking to about the payers. Um, issues. But the payer, guys, we're talking about an inclusion issue, not the payor, not the deduction. Oh, okay. Be careful, right? 
Is there a concept of constructive deduction, guys? No. Okay, so if the receiver, uh, well, even though bank is closed, and but he has he he can he's when he is able to get the check. You you're you're conflating cash equivalent with constructive receipt. You truly are. Look at the Paul Honing case. If the facts were different, suppose you were, everyone in this room were a football player. And, yeah, oh. Well, and then suppose I said, gee, you did a great job playing the game. And I give you the keys to the car. You could pick up the car, but you say, you know what? <coughs> Keep the key. I'll pick it up next year. Well, you're turning. I'm going to do my little turn, turning of my back. You can't turn your back as someone's, you've done the service already. The person is offering to pay you. You say, no, no, pay me the next year. Constructively received in the year that you're able to get the funds. They're set aside for you. Now, beforehand, if you negotiate before the services are performed, the football player says, if I win today's game, I do really well in the field. Don't pay me that bonus until next year. And there's no constructive receipt because the services have not yet been rendered. Get that distinction? But if you already rendered the services and the person's confident in the bids to give you funds, that's constructive receipt. Good? Yeah. Apologize, but I, I again come Wednesday. I want everyone to be able to nail this stuff. And you can't waffle. Wednesday is not a good day to waffle. You're supposed to know this stuff cold. In a sentence, professor. Can you put uh, what is constructive receipt is not the physical receipt of property, but it's the the funds or the income is being set aside for you, but you don't. Take it physically, but it's available if you want it. Thank you for sure. Again, that Paul Honing case was an interesting case only because it was the IRS saying there was no constructive receipt. Uh, but it had certain elements that you might have said, oh, very similar to constructive receipt. So um, what do we know about disbursements? What are we filling in that quadrant, guys? Remember? Are you looking at your notes? Certain instances, even if you pay it out, right? You may have to capitalize that expense, right? Because you pay out five years worth of rent. You can't deduct all five years worth of rent, right? So you have to worry about capitalization, the special rules, that law in revenue procedure or revenue ruling 78-38. When you use a check or a credit card to make a payment, and even though you're not out the cash, the government has said that's okay. Uh, we're still going to permit you to deduct that expense. There's no constructive deductions, right? There's constructive receipt, but there's no analog with respect to constructive deductions. At the bottom of page 611, and on 612, at, um, we saw in the Vantage case, and the code memorialized this, that if you're a cash method taxpayer, and you pay for something that extends into the next tax year, right? That you can still get a deduction. That's 263A 4. Regulation 263 4. 4. Talked on page 613 about the deductibility of interest. And mortgage points that generally they have to be amortized 
over the term of the loan. We also learn that there's an exception for points paid on a mortgage. That was the cash method. And the second half of the chapter deals with the accrual method. Any questions on the cash method? The accrual method. We're all good on the case. Again, which is more accurate? The accrual method is more accurate, but sometimes harder. Absorb. So, we go Spring City, and we don't look at the solvency issues of the payor, not their accrued in income. <coughs> Looked at North American Oil, stands for what proposition? On page 623. What proposition? Uh, claim of right property. Claim of right. Exactly. It's, uh, you want to tell us what that means? What is the claim of right? What is the claim of right? One thing to say is, what does it mean? Uh, you can't report it un until you physically have it, so you have to go further. We'll go further. What does that mean? And how is as an accrual method taxpayer? <clears throat> what's its significance? Have possession of the. And in other words, usually you have to earn it, right? You guys, you accountants, for gap purposes, you got to earn it. In the claim of right doctrine, you have unrestricted access to cash. Someone prepays you. You haven't really earned it, but you could go down to Atlantic City. Yeah. Obviously, saying that metaphorically. Um, then you have to include it in income, right? <coughs> claim of right. Government says that's a good time to tax people. Let's not wait. The courts, beginning on page 629, 630, talk about back to if, if beginning on page, if you look at the one, two, third, third paragraph down, there's a few different court cases there that seem to say, suggest that these dealt with baseball teams that, hey, you could defer it if you could really know the schedule that was going to unfold. Um, you could defer it for possibly many years. But Congress, the 2017 Act on page 630, we're going to see an example of this coming up in momentarily, permits up to just a one year deferral. That's the, the Congress. There was this issue, Congress put this issue to bed. So um, I'm going to just add Code Section 451C. Now, changes what once were, was um, and add some clarity. Authors then talk about inventories. You guys should be experts. And then turn to the deduction side of things. And check to deductions. What's critical, guys? What do you need? What's a critical factor to get a deduction for the control method taxes? Need economic performance, right? Even if the so called all events test has been met. incur a liability it's not sufficient the fact that you may have a liability is not sufficient there has to be economic performance where is this memorialized Code section 461h 461h but if you want a deduction and on page 637 there's a Schuler decision reflected the fact under prior law, 
it was sufficient, the liability was established. This, you know, actual liability, you got a deduction. But Congress said, no, no, no. We're not going to allow taxpayers to take a deduction just because they have a liability. They actually have to have economic performance uh, before they can accrue a deduction. And we went through on page 645 some of the problems. We, we, we got up to, I believe, problem three, if I'm not mistaken, for your notes, right? I'm going to pull up the we did last class. Anyone else have your notes from last class? I believe you left off on chapter two. Left off on page 645, problem three. Yes? All right. Before I go on, any questions in general about this material? Any questions? Um, the folks on WebEx, if you have any questions, uh, about material we've covered to date or this particular chapter, let me know. Um, and then I've always got to ask since Monday, if anyone did anything interesting over the weekend aside from studying tax? I did anything interesting this weekend? Well, my parents were here. And where are your parents from? Uh, South Korea. Yeah. yeah. Time shopping, watch Trent from Mawapara. Have they been here before? Yeah, several times. Right. So, did you go with them? Yeah, so we went to New York City, watch Trent from Mawapara, oh. some shopping. Phantom of the Opera, great show. Yeah. Right. <laughs> How many of you guys have seen Phantom of the Opera? No one? Good. You enjoy it? All oh, right. Next time they're here. See the Kill a Mockingbird. Oh. Great show. Okay. I like the book, though, but I'm not sure about the show. Go see the show. Really? Yeah, it's a great show. I thought so. Anyone else? Anything interesting? Um, I made it to Princeton on Sunday to visit some friends. And Princeton is always a hopping town, right, guys? Never been. Never been? I'll put it on my list. Right, James? No. Try to make it down to Princeton. <laughs> Easy enough. You do not need a passport to, to be able to make it down there. No movies for anyone? Question three. You ready? Where we pick the, picked up? Um, so we have a crew, a calendar year, uh, crew method taxpayer, runs a dance school which offers dance lessons over 48 months with one lesson each month. No makeup lessons are offered, nor is the 48 month period extended for a participant who misses any scheduled lessons. The cost of the lessons is $480 or $10 per session. Okay. Per lesson, which is required to be prepaid in January of year one. Based on prior experience, the crew has found that each lesson, including salaries, rents, and utilities, costs about $4 per person. On January 1st of year one, 100 students sign up. And pay for lessons which commence January 1st. A crew reports $12,000 of income, right? That's $10 per month per student or 100 times um, 100, uh, 100 times 120. Uh, dance schools audited financial statements for year one discuss a crew's tax consequences. So picture, if you will, is paying about $120, not about, they're paying $120 a year, right? There's 100 students. And that's why they're paying $480 up front. What would you guys do for gap purposes? Um, how would you report this for gap purposes, guys? Um, I would report as unearned revenue because it's not really. How, how, how much would you report each year? Sorry? $120 or $12,000 each year. Okay. Right? And what would be your expenses? Okay. 
what's the total expenses for the year, each year? How many, how many lessons are there? There's one a month, right? $48. 4800 $4, right? Yes. We get the visual that you would report $12,000 and take $4,800 as expenses. Agreed? We'd report about $7,200 a year. Agreed? For financial statement purposes. Okay. That's what you would... And now, for tax purposes, tax purposes, what would you report? Don't say it out loud. Write down some numbers based on what we just spoke about. Something minus four for the cost. Forty-eight hundred. Cost is forty-eight hundred, right? We agreed. We would have a different number for year one. Mind, right? I think it's me, guys. I, I really, yeah. um, keep in mind that you could, under North American Oil, they're getting all this money up front, right? I would agree that in principle you could include the entirety of this, right? We normally, but here we know, as the authors described. There's a fixed schedule, right? So it's definitively, it's not left open to question, right? When this money is going to be earned. We know with specificity it can be earned over this four year period. Agreed? Very unusual. So, year one, under prior law, prior law, under the Devil Rays case and those baseball cases, it was left open to issues of whether or not this could be extended, this concept, over the four-year period. But what did Congress do in 2017? One year is the maximum. One year is the maximum. So what ends up happening is, and this is only if you elect, okay? You don't elect, you got to include it all in year one. I repeat, if you don't make an election, you got to include it all in year one. Under Code Section 451C, 451 deals with inclusion issues, right? Could you show us what that would look like? Um, $48,000 minus $4,800 in year one. So if you don't make an election, $48,000 minus $4,800, right? I mean, then what you end up doing if you don't make an election, the loss of income in the next three years, you show losses, right? Under no, new code section 451C, you make the election, take the first year of the income, and then what ends up happening is the next year you've got to take the balance of 36000 and you have $4,800 worth of expenses. That's the normal. That's after the, if an election is made. That's in the code section that has four. 451C. Kind of like straight line it out. No, you're not allowed. Never. It, it was never clear if you could, but now Congress took that away. And why did Congress do it? This is one of those things that, first of all, there was Congress was always thinking, saying, gee, claim of right doctrine. Congress was always thinking, gee, when's the best time to tax someone when they have $48,000 as opposed to years later? Who knows what they're going to have, right? And then there becomes, oh, we want to cut the corporate tax rate from 31 down to 21%. How do we help pay for that, right? These are all maneuvers Congress uses because when you institute Code Section 451C, the Joint Committee on Taxation will score this and say, gee, um, is 
this will raise an extra billion dollars of revenue over a 10 year period. So that will help pay for the corporate tax cut. So all those ingredients go into making this happen. So if you say to a, why aren't we doing it in year one? Congress is giving a little bit of a grace here. And if you don't make the election, you do have to include it all in year one. And what's the election under? What code section? Code section 451 c yeah. For years I taught this, and that's the fun thing about teaching taxes. It's not like teaching Roman history. Things change all the time. And here, you one thing, but now I say something else because the world has changed. Question four. Discuss the tax consequences of the parties involved in the following alternatives. Is a corporation, a cruel method taxpayer, orders $3,000 for the carpet cleaning for Mr. Carpet Cleaner on a cash basis on the taxpayer on November 1st of year one? Which it receives and pays for the carpet cleaning on April 1st of year two? Who wrote both Widget and Mr. Carpet Cleaner or calendar year taxpayer? All right, guys. So you want to set up your chart. Question four. Question issues and inclusion issues, right? What else might you do in terms of labeling for exam purposes? If I were you, you might consider doing it. Anything else you might say, gee, would it be very careful for Wednesday? I'm going to label. Label, do you already have updated for D and what do? Production issues, conclusion issues. What else would you label? Help you navigate. Yes, thank you. So he's a cruel and taxpayers cash. Hey, <coughs> cruel taxpayers cash. There are three different colors going. So all I'm saying is for the exam, it's going to be imperative that you label. I think cash or accrual deduction or inclusion issues. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to absorb all this if you're not, and you gotta, I mean, part of the fun of tax is being very analytical and saying, hey, this is where it belongs and it fits this pattern or depreciation mechanically. And that's supposed to be your strength, guys. And you're supposed to be very good analytically, and that's what brought you to the program. And here they say, uh, the tire meets the pavement. Let's see. So question A, let's go through this and I'll ask. Year one or year two? And why? For both. And we can role play and see if you're right. As a corporation, I would say year one. Oh, I don't say yet. Don't, don't say yet, Justin. I want to see if everyone. Uh, gets the same answer. So everyone write down year one or year two. We got it? Justin, you want to go and then David, see if you agree. Uh, so for uh, Widget Corporation, I would say year one. But who would? Up there. Why, hey. would, why would you wait until they receive the service, they perform the service? Does that matter when they perform the service? You know, what's the benchmark when the cash method taxpayer has to take it into income? They take the money when they receive it. Otherwise, you're just going to get it wrong, and it's not going to be good on Wednesday, and I'm not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. So you got the answer right, but that was just by accident. And you may not get it right by accident on the exam. Mr. Carpet Cleaner has in Inclusion when, or excuse me, deduction when? Uh, year one, 3,000. Do you agree, David? James, do you agree? Well, for all 12 months in year two. Right. Having this for all 12 months in year two. I see you. Do you agree? Uh, how much would you deduct in year one and how much would you deduct in 
What do you say? Yes. As to what? Year one or year two? Year one. Why? Uh, since the service is done in year one. Is it? David, when is the service performed? Oh, so it should be. Why? And what's your test, Shervon? What's the test to get the promised land of a deduction? What do you need? Economic performance. Economic performance doesn't happen until year two. So year two is the right answer. Everyone agree? You need economic performance. Is there a code section for economic performance? Yes, code section 461H. Well, this lends itself to multiple choice questions, right? <laughs> Same as A, except which it pays $3,000 for Mr. Perfect Cleaner on December 1st of year one, but expect the perfect cleaning to be done. On April 1st of year two. All right, don't say it out loud. When does each get it? When does Richard get a deduction? When does corporate cleaner have inclusion? I'm going to ask you. Year one or year two? Don't say it loudly because the people on WebEx want to hear you. So inclusion is year one. Okay, Jiang, you agree? And why, Jiang? Because <coughs> for the inclusion, um, paid. Who's on the claim? Okay, he paid it at. Um, Who's he? The carpet cleaner. I mean, not, not the carpet cleaner. I mean, um, the widget. I mean, the carpet cleaner received cash. Year one, his um, basis was for widget corporation economic performance was going up. Everyone agree? Is there a code section for when the cash received? Claiming out 451. 51A in the regulations. Question C. Same as A, except that the corporate cleaning occurs on December 1st of year one. So the cleaning now happens on December 1. Priya? Ravon, see if you agree. Raza. Year one, I agree. Uh, economic, economic performance was done in year one and uh, cash was paid in year one. When was it paid? Same as in A. When does the corporate cleaner receive the cash, guys? Where do you say that? It's the same as in A. <coughs> and I disagree. Get the corporate, he doesn't get the money until year two, guys. Just be careful about your reading, right? You don't want to get it wrong because you misread something, right? No part of the equation. When does carpet cleaner have to include it? That's the easy part. Look together. I know James is anxious to see this. Code section 461H talks about criminal liability that occurred before economic performance, right? Guys who are now no longer hikers attacks or seasoned veterans, we always have our general rule and we have an exception. Look at code section 461H3. <coughs> 461H3. No 
Notwithstanding paragraph one, the item shall be treated as incurred during any taxable year if no events test with respect to such item is met during the taxable year. Economic performance with, uh, with respect to such item occurs within the shorter of a reasonable time after the close of the year or certainly within even half months. Such item is reoccurring in nature and the taxpayers consistently treat items of such kind as incurred in the tax bill in New York's requirements of one little I, a clause little I are met, and four little I. Such item is not a material item for the accrual of such item with the, the, um, the more proper match. And if you go through this, in this case, this is one of those insignificant reoccurring items. And in this case, um, the code is permitting just for de minimis items that widget company could take a deduction in year one. If you look at problem E, by way of contrast, it says it doesn't pay for it until October 1st. If you look at October 1st, that's beyond eight and a half month safe harbor. So if it's beyond a half an eight and a half safe harbor, then it's year two and year two. Um, sometimes we have seen this throughout the code that when you have related parties, and sometimes with related parties, Congress puts up impediments to get deductions, for example, sales between related parties. Code section 267 disallows the loss. Or if you have sales between spouses, right, gains and losses disallowed. And not surprisingly, sometimes if you have related parties, Congress forces the same accounting method on both. And where's this memorialized? And not surprising if you want to open up to section 267. Two, there has to be a match okay, in accounting method. Let's see how this applies. Um, 7A2 says if a reason and the method of accounting the person to whom payment is to be made, the amount thereof is not includable in the gross income, and at the close of the taxable year, the taxpayer for which now, would have been deductible under this chapter, both taxpayer and the person to whom the payment is to be made, a person specified in paragraph B, subparagraph B, or a person specified in subparagraph B, related parties. So if you're a related party, then any deduction allowable under this chapter, respective such amount, shall be allowable as of the day of which the amount is includable. So you only get a deduction if there is an inclusion issue. We're going to see that come up momentarily. So here, there has to be symmetry. Justin, you'll be glad to know, because you're raising it, on page 47, there's a discussion of code section 467. Why am I raising this? This will not be on the exam. Um, but it just it doesn't hurt to just glance at this. This deals with issues of your know, rental payments and other payments for services, people, taxpayers, front load or back load those so that they can achieve certain, and they're not related parties. They're just trying to achieve certain, def generally deferral issues or the like, that Congress essentially does not permit that kind of gamesmanship. So um, you're not going to be held, Code Section 467 is very complicated code section, but the authors have it here just to illustration purposes, but you're not going to be held accountable for it. Okay? So if you guys have enough on your plate, I uh, don't have to add this to your plate. Okay? hope no one's disappointed. Um, so, last set of questions on page 649. These are the following situations to determine in what year the payor would be allowed a deduction and what year the payee would have to include the amount is gross income. Okay. 
A, an accrual method taxpayer, were to receive five hundred dollars worth of janitorial supplies in year one from B, who is unrelated to A, um, who is a cash method taxpayer. The supplies are used in A's cleaning business. A makes the five hundred dollar payment to B sometime in year two. So you guys don't say it out loud, anyone. Out and inclusion. Both in year two? Yeah. In year one and then year two. And why, Shia? Okay, economic performance happens when? Year one, right? Cash is received when? Year two. Right? Economic performance, right, James? Year one? 61H. Or 61. H. And we're all good? Okay, what happens? Question B, same as A, except that A and B are father and daughter. Did that change things? Don't say it out loud. What's something you were going to say? Uh, it's both deduction and inclusion. Why? What's your authority? Uh, A2, right? Because 267A2 says essentially. You have to match the deduction with the inclusion with related parties. Or father and daughter related parties, guys? Sure. Why? How do you connect the dots? Yeah, um, it's in, I think, 267. Let's start with B1. Yeah. Oh, and B1 says it's. Go to C4. Yeah, C4. And C4, they said um, the family of. Your ancestors and lineal descendants, which would include your daughter, right? So they're related parties, and 267A2 says, hey, you, Dad, you can't take a deduction until your daughter includes it in income, right? And what about question C? A result in B above, A uses the cash method, and B uses the accrual method. Say it out loud. The deduction is in the grave district. Both in year one. David, final word? Do we have a different answer or you're both? Let's, let's face it. In problem B, why is code section 267 there from a policy perspective? What, what did Congress not want to happen? Question B. Congress was concerned that the father would get a deduction in year one, the daughter would get deferral until year two, right? There was a mismatch. I would agree that that doesn't, that doesn't bode well when you have a mismatch with inclusion and deduction. But here, when should father include the income in question C? What does he receive the cash? Well, hold on. Um, the, the daughter, I should say the other way around. When does the, um, when does the daughter who's performing the services, um, when should she, she's a cruel, right? The cash in year two. She was cash, but now she's accrual. Right. But so it doesn't. But when did she earn it as a accrual? Year, year, year one. Year one. Year one. Right. So year one, right? And when does the father get a deduction normally? Right. Because that's when he makes the payment. Everyone agree? 
But does Congress have a concern here? The answer is categorically not, right? right? Because here, the income is being front-loaded, right, in year one. That's good for the government. And the deduction is not until year two, which is also good for the government. Because notice how Code Section 267 applies. Matching a deduction with the income, but we don't have to worry about this in question C, right? Because Congress has no concern here. Congress is only worried when they make it's a one-way street, baby. So you can't deduct in your one. Yeah, that would be incorrect. That would be absolutely incorrect. Because this is the right answer, and there's no forced accounting method because Congress has no concern here. In problem B, Congress has a legitimate concern of a mismatch. In every case, that deduction or inclusion deductions are just keeping the government from getting the money. Read the Code Section 267A2. You'll see Congress is saying, no, no, you don't get the deduction until you have inclusion. It doesn't read the other way around. Yeah, you got that? It looks like you do. So this problem on page uh, 649 is just to illustrate that. Now, what is question two about? Question two, something that we as practitioners always confront, are the parties truly related, okay? You may have your own gut reaction, but gut reactions we know in tax don't get you very far. If anything, they get, may get you into trouble, right? So you need to take your gut reaction and see if you can anchor it with authority. By the way, let me just say this. When you take corporate tax, if, again, you're in good hands. Professor Kornstein is wonderful. But if you get stuck on something, uh, feel free, guys, to shoot me an email. I'm in corporate tax, so um, if you're stuck and you want another you know, perspective that it's not as fun, uh, reach out to me. Two. So are these related parties? We have X Corporation, the accrual method taxpayer, leases a parcel of land from B, a cash method taxpayer. Uh, B owns 60 out of the 100 shares of X Corporation, common stock and outstanding. X Corporation has no other classes of stock. What do you think? If you own 60% of a company, do you think you're related to that company? Yes. And do you have authority? Now that you, your gut tells you so, anything that jumps off the page that says, oh, you're related? Okay, code section 267B, where? B2. B2, right? Sounds like Battleship, right? B2. More than 50%. Anything greater than 50%, you're related party. Suppose you don't own, in the prior problem, 60%, but you own 40 shares. Um, your spouse owns 15 shares, and the remaining shares are held by unrelated parties. What do you think? Related party or not, Nelly? Related. Related party. Good hope. Um, that you and your spouse see eye to eye on things. I'm on the treadmill watching. Do you guys ever see the movie This Is 40? No? You guys are too young to watch it. It's um, 267C3. Yeah, 267C2 and C4. Spouse is considered um, as if. Right? C4, member of your family. Let's hope so, right? So would 267A2 apply here? It would. Because B is on cash. Yeah. I mean, we need to know more about the fact pattern of who's taking the deduction and who's getting the inclusion. Oh, right? so we're not worried about that. We're not. We're just seeing if it's if, if 267 even applies. In this, in question B, um, 
Yes. Two, and then you know, do they, you need a combination platter here if you got to make sure a member of a family, right? And then C. Um, suppose B only owns twenty shares. The spouse owns fifteen shares. Well, we already know remember the thirty-five, but now B. And Z partnership own 40 more <coughs> shares of the corporation. The remaining shares are held by unrelated parties. Z, um, B and Z, unrelated parties, each have a 50% stake in the capital and profits of, um, of the B and Z partnership. In other words, we know B going out of the gate owns 35%, but it is B deemed own here through the partnership. And James, you have your hand up. Yes, you have authority for that. But you need a bridge to get you about the ownership and the partnership being owned by oh, C2. That's by or for his family, but that's not that's C one, James. It's C one, stock owned directly or indirectly by a partnership shall be considered as owned proportionally by its partners. So B is deemed to own right, twenty out of the forty shares because he owns fifty percent of the partnership. Does that get him above fifty percent? The answer is yes, right? So he owns 20 shares plus his wife's 15 plus the 20 from the partnership. Is he above 50? Yes. Uh, question C, or D, I should say. Name is C, except that B and Z partnership only own 20 shares of the corporation. Does that get you above 50%? And you're shaking your head no, right? What no. does it get you to? You to 45, right? Right? Now you're getting good at this. Question E. Same as A, that the B owns 20 shares in X, the spouse owns 15 shares, and S and Z partnership own 20 shares of X corporation. The remaining shares are held by unrelated parties. S and Z, an unrelated party, each own 50% interest in the capital and profits of S and Z partnership. It gets a little, I agree. But when you extrapolate from that, he owns 50 directly, he owns his spouse's shares, so we're up to 35. <laughs> in the time, yeah, yes. Same as be before, it's not going to be related parties. Okay? Not going to work. Final question. And F. Same as A, except that B owns 30 shares. S, B, spouse owns 15 shares. Spouse's brother, the brother in law, owns 10 shares. The remaining shares are held by unrelated parties. Brother in law is. Could you go from the brother to the wife to the husband, right? Okay, so if, if the, the wife, if we focus on the wife, it can be because spouse and the brother, right? But the question is, can you have double attribution? In other words, if you were married to Raz and we were brother James, I was your brother, I own 10 shares, my shares are to you because his brothers, right, siblings, you be deemed to own each other's yeah, shares. We're related parties, but then that's, that okay. means. But then could there be double attribution where it goes from you now to your wife? Because we're related parties? Well, your spouses. Yeah, yeah. We're related parties. You're related parties, so could there be? Okay? And this is answered in Code Section 267C5. Construct constructively owned by a person by reason of application of paragraph one, shall be for purposes of applying one, two, or three, be treated as actually owned. So you can have double attribution. 
respect to one, two, or three, but stock constructively owned by an individual by reason of paragraphs two and three shall not be treated by him for purposes, again, applying uh, either of such paragraphs in order to make another a constructive owner of such stock. And what that says is essentially there, there will not be constructive ownership with, with various family members because, look, it's the old six degrees of separation, meaning in this room, right, if we took a DNA test, um, we're all related, right? Somehow, some way, if we go up enough generations. So if you were allowed to have reattribution, um, what would end up happening, we keep reattributing and somehow we'd all own each other's shares. So the Internal Revenue Code under Code Section 267C5 says there's no double attribution. And that makes sense in the fi family context because um, James may not get along with his brother-in-law or sister-in-law for that matter. So there's no attribution from one, one party to the next when it comes to members of the family. That was C5? Yeah. It, doesn't it also just say that in C4 as well? It, says, it only says whole or half blood, but it doesn't say that. Yeah, but, but, but the point is, if you yeah. think about it, once you own something constructively, if you look at C5, you're deemed to actually own it. So once my shares are deemed actually owned by James, because we're brothers, then by extension, since he's deemed, you might think his wife would own the deemed to be owned the shares constructively. But there's no double attribution. Wait, so you're saying in this case, let's say James is my brother and his wife owns shares. That so wouldn't be doesn't count. doesn't count for me. Right. Does yeah, not but his look. shares count. All right, so look guys, let me ask you, because I, I, I said, Min, do you have a question? Oh, so you did switching? S is switching. S would be, the spouse would be, because she would be deemed to own her brother's shares, she would be deemed to own um, her spouse's shares. But the, the spouse uh, itself, in this case, your, your point's well taken, he not deemed to own be related parties. Yin's point is the spouse is deemed to own her brother's shares as well as her spouse's shares, and she would be deemed a related party. So, guys, let me just say this and those people on uh, WebEx as well. Um, I don't know if you guys, I took, if you recall, maybe you guys can't forget, if you recall, um, before our midterm, I took an extra hour, we met an extra hour early. So I sort of, you have some time in the bank. Uh, having said that though, I don't know if you have any general questions um, about any material or anything specifically regarding this chapter. So I'm gonna be, a, go ahead, Gian. So can you, uh, can you write, the, I mean, can you kind of like list all the chapters for us? I mean, you know the chapters, right? Yeah, but still. So uh, everything after midterm, right? Oh, it's cumulative. Oh, it's cumulative, so everything. Everything. Okay. Stop right there. Everything. Okay, everything. Okay. But more heavily weighted towards the second half. Oh, sure. Okay. You said about 70 30. Okay. I mean, this general concept that obviously resonates throughout taxes, you've got to have a handle. So we'll be around. I'm not going anywhere. So if you guys do have last minute questions, just make sure the subject line, you do put income tax student or something. If you don't get a hold of me, don't be bashful, send me an email, another email or two or three. Um, I have every intention. I do check my voicemails regularly. I'm not in the office. Um, and I am gonna see about possibly having the moving exam possibly a half an hour earlier, just may make it easier. Let me get back to, let's, let's just make sure this room is definitely available. Let's plan for those on WebEx that we will have the exam beginning at 1.30, but I'll confirm that, okay? Um, and the exam will probably be about two hours and 45 minutes, something in that. Right? Oh, so we'll be able to stay out we'll two times. On, on James, what was that? And, and you said the exam two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, something we'll like that. Starting half an hour early, so I can start at two hours hour. and 30 minutes. Half time after, four o'clock, continue? No, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, uh, in other words, we're gonna go, 
Let's do the arithmetic. Uh, it's very good. Uh, 415. All right, I want to make sure too. Um, okay. All right, guys, any any other questions, issues, concerns? And the, and the format is similar to the Very similar. Term, just, uh, just more questions. Multiple choice. More fun. Yeah. Yeah. And um, would it be effective, like, for the, we covered, like, for the midterm? Could it be good to, like, study the actual midterm exam? Like, the questions would be very similar to what we had on the midterm exam. Okay, I got you. Look, no, no goal line of mine is to fool people. I, I really, if you've been here coming to class or if you couldn't come to class listening on WebEx, and if you couldn't listen on WebEx, you listen to the recordings, you'll do fine. Um, you're not going to see anything that varies at all from what we've done in class. Uh, also, uh, can we use like the mid our midterm exam as like a note, like as our notes within the actual? Yeah, it's open book. Okay, so we can use that as one of our. Yeah. These notes too, like. Whatever you want. Oh, we can get actual notes too. Absolutely. But guys, just bear in mind, people get mad at me. There's a lot of questions. You're not going to have time to research. So do not rely on your notes and say, okay, I'll, if I don't know something, I'll, I'll, I'll research it. It's going to be too late, okay? So you got to come in knowing this stuff cold. And then I don't want people to lose sleep at night. If you get stuck as a practitioner, we all open the code, we open the regulations, but there's certain things that you should just come naturally and come quickly and make you very versed for the water cooler conversations to impress people during your internship. And remember, if I didn't say this, remember, every time I, during the internship, every meal you eat with associates, you're being judged, I hate to tell you that. Um, so just be very, very um, sensitive to that. Um, don't put down your guard during your internship and figure, oh, these guys are my contemporaries and I, I can tell them that, that guy's a real SOP. Um, that will get back to that guy, okay? Uh, don't order the spaghetti with the sauce all over. Okay? I'm, I'm renowned for that and getting it all over myself. He's smarter than I am. It's not hard to do, but just be very savvy about the fact that every time these people go with you somewhere, they have to fill out an evaluation form. Okay? They are not your friends. And I'm not saying it be that you have to be cynical and think, you know, these are evil, but they're asked to say, would you want to work with this person? So just and I, I sound like it, but if they ask you to have a drink over, have coffee, have water, um, don't don't drink alcohol. I hate to say it, but don't don't be foolish like that. So when you're on the internship. And don't, I, I know so many people, when I say so many, there is a certain percentage of people when they go out to lunch, they say, oh, the firm's picking it up and let's just order whatever we can. Let's get the three appetizers and uh, we'll get the uh, surf and turf and then we'll get dessert and we'll get the cappuccino <laughs> because the firm's picking it up. But that sends a message, okay? We do not want to be that person. This is not the time that go over the top guys okay I'm telling you it's going to send a message and you got to put your best foot forward so just try to be spartan about your lunch orders or if you go out to dinner um, do not order oh, that's my own opinion you guys may see the world differently but, um, just be very sensitive to that get stuck with the tax question during the internship you know where you you know where you want to call, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me know. I think someone asked a question. Someone's asking a question. Is there any way we could get more practice problems? I mean, guys, there's a ton. Who, who got the study problems? There, there's a ton of study. No, you were going to say. Yes, I have the handbook, but it's a little bit hard to, like, formulate if you could give us, like, a specific that would help us. I mean, like, for did, instance, did you get the other? The other study guide because that, but well, you have both. Aren't there a lot of problems in there, Nelly? Yes, and we get so confused by so many problems. Uh, like, if you could guide us specifically, I, I mean, it's these. impossible. I mean, but it really follows what we do in the book, of course. So, um, I, I don't know what to tell you because there's two, at least two books with a lot of problems. And once you look, guys, when you go into Amazon and you pick up that book, when I say that book, um, 
I mean, it's a little late. It's a little late, I know. Yeah, but I mean, if you went on Amazon and you get overnight, um, this, you know, they will lead you to like three other books with questions and answers. So I don't have any any generic short answers. I always say to people, that's a good source. And if, if Nelly, you or other people are using those two other supplementary books or you guys online, you can look, I guarantee if you Google sample income tax questions, you'll come related to depreciation, you'll come across problems. And if you don't, I mean, look, you know, and I know that sometimes the answers on the internet are not accurate. So if, if you do the problem and you come up with a different answer, you want to run it by me, that's fine. But I don't have a test bank of saying, here's another hundred problems that you yourselves on. I apologize, but that's, but I don't have it, but they are, they are available on the internet, guys. That's what I would say. Right, so if you do get stuck, those people on WebEx, uh, the people here with anything, just reach out to me. Otherwise, I will see you here, at least with tentativeness, uh, 130 sharp on, um, on Wednesday, okay? Guys, good luck studying. I want to. I hope everyone impresses me. Professor, one question. Sure, Ron. Yes, Professor. Can you uh, touch on characterization yeah. a little bit? What about characterization of income? You mean gains and losses? Just like all of them. Like, That's all where of them I struggle right. most. All right. I mean, just for characterization, guys, you got to remember: is it capital gain? Is it ordinary income? Is it recapture income? Is it 1231 gain? Capital gain, ordinary income. Capture income? 1231 gain? And what it shouldn't be, answers that don't work for me, gross income? That's not taxable income? It doesn't work. I would say it's exempt from income. If that, that works if you say there's no character because it's exempt. That works for me. Um, but those are the things. I mean, there's not a hundred different characters, guys. So it's like five. We get yeah. into it five. Including. I, I'm just letting you know, I, and I warn people before the midterm, do not use gross, do not use taxable. And it's several people use gross is how people use taxable, which doesn't tell the client anything. <coughs> Capture in 1231. Recapture would be 1245 until 50, right? Well, 1245, 1250 is actually, James, if you want to add unrecaptured, 1250 games. Nelly, it's not recapture, it's unrecaptured. Just put like recaptured income, would it be wrong or you want well, 1245 is recaptured, so, but if it's real estate, you want to put 1245 for a building because it's 1250 unrecaptured gain. Well, the hodgepodge is the traditional 1231. You got to see if the gains exceed the losses or the losses exceed the gains. And then we have two exceptions to that rule. We have 1231A4C, which deals with catastrophic losses. That goes in the sub hodgepodge. Oh. And then we have code section 1231C, the look back rule. We look back five years, and anytime we have a 1231 loss, you, up to that amount, you recharacterize your 1231 gains as ordinary income. This is for 1231 gains to recharacterize. After the fact. It does not change the numerical outcome. Right, quick one example. Let's go back to our tractor. Okay. And we're going to track we're doing 1231C. We took a tractor year one, we depreciated 60, and our adjusted basis becomes 40. And we sell it the one tractor, say for 35. Your loss? What's the character? Character? 
And you know it. Don't hold back. Character. How's that? Extraordinary. You say it with a question mark. Say extraordinary, right? The losses exceeded the gains for the year, right? Next year, we have another tractor. We have another adjusted basis of 40. And we sell it for 110. Okay? We sell it for 110. What's our gain? 70, right? Code section 1001. Tell me, what is the character? Don't say it out loud. What's the character of that $70 gain if this were an exam? So we have 60,000. All 45. What about the remaining 10? Why? 45,000. Oh. Right. We recharacterized of the 10, 5 is. 1231C, ordinary income. Ordinary income. The remaining five, 1231 gain. I think it's like if it's a sub hodgepodge, there was uh, the. Uh, the sub hodgepodge is taken off the table. We don't care about the sub hodgepodge. Don't worry about the sub hodgepodge for these purposes. I'm not going to complicate that, James. Five Ks. When we look back, we had five K of losses here, right? And we have to recharacterize up to five K of losses as ordinary income. It was $10,000 loss. What is the remaining $10,000 in the next year? So you want to make the fair market value? I apologize. 25 here, so the loss is 10. So what you want yeah, to I'm saying, what if the loss was 10 there? In the next year, when we sold it for 70, uh, then it would be, it would all just be $10,000 ordered. That's all I'm yeah, saying. It would be all ordered. 